Well, thank you for having me here. I've, I've known Rebecca Edwards' poetry for many years, and I'm honored to introduce her here at the Holloway Reading Series. Over the years, Rebecca has garnered many awards for her poetry, including the Joseph Fallon Award for Poetry through the San Francisco Foundation, the Eisner Award for Poetry through the University of California at Berkeley, the Editor's Prize through the New Delta Review, the State of California Inna Coolbrith Award in Poetry, the Mary Merritt Henry Award for Poetry through Mills College, and the Malcolm Wood Writing Award through the California College of Arts. She holds creative and scholarly degrees from Mills College and from the University of California at Berkeley. The San Francisco Foundation described Rebecca's writing as spare, eloquent, moving poetry that is suffused with poignant insight, formal surprises, a wonderful eye for detail, and an inventive integration of proverbs and folk idioms. I first encountered Rebecca's poetry in the early 1990s while she was at Mills College completing her undergraduate work. And that was the period in which she won the Inna Coolbrith Award for Poetry, a contest which is actually open to all university and college students throughout uh, California. Her delicate weave of image, emotion, and texture creates a strength that lingers. One passage from a poem of apology for not noticing a loved one's haircut evoked the color of dry California hillsides, depicted the landscape as one of ancestry and life, then concluded that the loved one had become the narrator's homeland. I still find the poignancy of that poem returns to me now and then, like a memory triggered by a fragrance or sound. Last year, I reopened Redwood Coast Press to publish first books of poetry. We accepted international submissions, and the editorial team, formed by Angela Spinecki of Toronto, Julia Chisholm of Napa, and myself, chose Rebecca's poetry manuscript entitled Thens Elsewhere to publish. We chose it because of the musicality and the truly finely wrought nature of the work. So it's been my delight to re-encounter Rebecca Edwards' poetry and to introduce her here today. Thank you. That's, um, I don't think I've ever had a nicer introduction. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I'm really happy to be here tonight, uh, a little nervous. And um, I'm going to read for about 15 minutes. Um, this first poem I'm going to read is called Palinopsia. And uh, I was absolutely delighted when Jeffrey referred to it as a series of equations because that's what it felt like. Um, but when I was practicing it today, I realized that I'm using the word practice um, in multiple waves, some marked and not, that don't come across so clearly when they're just off the page. So I wanted to say two things. I use practice as informs practice to reference martial arts practice, particularly the way in which it's a kinetic kinesthetic history that gets passed down generation to generation between teacher and student. And the other kind of practice is poya practice, which is a meditation practice you do to prepare yourself for death, or you do when somebody is dying to help them. So, palinopsia for the students of Professor Colleen Gregan. Lights, apiary, is all hum. In the driveway, cluttered, a month's worth of candles, a bell. Inside the house, even the rose petals are too heavy, even the incense. She asks the light to crumble her bones. Hives, brilliant, metrical, arboreal, Feather to flock, salt to sea. Metonymy names beyond existence, light. And the practice is to help the just dead, attritial, larval, embryotic, flicker, enter. Combs of coronas and counterpoint.
The precise nature of light is one of the key questions of modern physics. And the practice is so we will recognize it and not turn back. A shift of air on the chin, without eyes, maybe she will find it like that. But caress cannot compass without surface. There is no whistle in the absence of bone. Then she will have to remember it. Did she pay enough attention? Honey of amplitudes. Luminosity is the amount of energy a body radiates per unit time. Metonymy drills recognition, as informs practice, training, to catch sight of something that has always existed somewhere, to express the something with our body, memorizing, consolidating, applying, to inhabit the glints. A podian frequency, brightness, particle, The image can never be brighter than the source. How to grasp the specter, that which persists even after the corresponding stimulus has left, which halos after the direct gaze, the double vision, conflating object and absence, the untenable parting comment, I am entirely committed to you. Cruising the understory, they collect the makings. In the photograph, they all walk just like her. The wish caught in a trick of paper and light, and like the pulp comb of wasps, they make a nest of it. Practice persists even after and gesture. This next poem is called Then's Elsewhere. She is outside the double open parentheses. Grammar of remembering. Childhood's dream that sun typed in the dark where now, then, and thence elsewhere punctuate one inside the other, linguistic mixing bowls, Ukrainian dolls, unresolved clauses, blue ink on blue paper, filed away with all the other fragments. They collect shiny things and hide them elsewhere no wonder then they took to recursive grammar. Those five starlings calling out and enclosing clauses, notes glossed through location and accretion, chatters interiority. Nests lined with gum foil, torn larvae socks, silver hair gleaned from a brush, surfaces retooled as inside. They have a talent for simile. Regress, retreat, withdraw into, pamphlets, talk shows, the kind doctor, explain it as if the self had an inside and an outside. The progression of the disease, a spiraling interiority. First they lose interest, then forget how, finally they refuse. Tomatoes, complaint, eye contact, they stop eating, talking, they sleep more. She will cave into herself, into. But the volume of her, does she elbow a place between the lungs, swell up in the ankles, stick full in the throat, harnessing the tongue, as if her 
a bug in a jar, buried? How do we diagram interiors, interior? We won't find her hidden like the tea bags in the toe of the sock, the empty wallets between the towels, the tinfoil and photographs under the mattress, the carefully folded Kleenex and silverware filed in her papers. The sun in the park, on the bench, on her hands, on her face, on her mouth, stuttering, the, the, mouthing, the, turning towards that which exists beyond its lost name. Words severed from sediment. As insects, then, we must mean through smell, through caress. And she would, grinning, said, by waggle dance, dear, by waggle. As if the self, like the tide, is found at its edge, the reach of the flattest end of the wave, what it washes over, what it leaves there, Her body outside of the fragment, pain's single parentheses, dissolving the grammar of starlings, the child, I was planted in a field of sunflowers, unable to run, face tracking the sun. Um, I'm going to read four poems from a series that's kind of a shift in voice, both from what I've been reading and for me in general, <laughs> but I thought I would try it tonight. This is from a series called Drawl. Morning Glories. She jumped the train to Denver tossed her three-year-old up, climbed in after because she wasn't going to be left behind with those people one more time. Those people, her family, and with her in the boxcar unmentioned, the drunk husband who my father never talks about. In the end, her glories grew to cover that final rock-filled scrap of yard. Weeds, really, but too pretty to mess with. Kin to dandelions, eucalyptus, cockroaches, styrofoam, us. The only genealogy mentioned. She didn't know much of it herself. And what she did, she didn't say. Midden. My father hates the eucalyptus. Not native, they were brought to California the way the Spanish brought the Christian God. They spread just as quickly and with the same violence. Weeds, he spits. Weed himself. After the migrant childhood, 15 towns in nine months, mandatory fistfight in every new school. After packing up in the middle of the night, prohibition against letting anyone know. After making it out, he sat down root, out in the dark dirt story. Drawl. I think that the mechanic is my uncle. His drawl calls me to planes that I have never seen in a life I would flee if it were mine. He sees it too. Talks me through the spark plug's oil change and how he joined the Marines when he was 16 after being thrown over by a girl whose photo he carried in his pocket for that whole Korean tour. Of course, I can't remember what she looks like. Haven't thought of her in years. Looking at me funny. Your people from Oklahoma, ain't they?
pocket knife. The second of two things inherited from my grandfather, tucked into the book shelf, always waiting to be opened, chipped and dull, and him dead by that which made him unspeakable. Okay. I'm going to close with a short poem. Um, it's actually a very old poem of mine, but I wanted to read it tonight for Mel. What to think of in a difficult year. The way they water the orchards at night to give the roots a fighting chance. How hard the day's dirt is, how in the heat the water is too fast for it, just runs off looking for some easier place. How the dark holds the water till it rises, meets, surrounds. How the weight of it presses against what is difficult, waits out resistance, waits for what is shut to open. How what is hidden pulls and pulls at what is given. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I'm really happy to have Lord Cyrus Consul out of Kansas. Um, here's what I have to say about him. The title of Cyrus Consul's first book, Brief Underwater, is among other things, a loose homophonic translation of Kafka's Brief an den Vater, that undelivered letter to a father, in which participation and resistance, escape and paralysis Blur. But rather than marking Consul's participation in a boys' club of letters to silent older men, Brief Underwater produces a relationship to the past of utterance more material than familial or filial. Rather than a letter, these are liter literally the letters. Sounds reavailed rather than a one sided conversation with a famous other. It's a titling decision that condenses Consul's relation to a Western literary past. Eminently available, it's always distorted and distorting when it touches the present and its Midwestern contents. And that's where the serial prose poems of Brief Underwater want to stay, poised on the fuzzy border between genres, athwart languages, but most importantly, at the intersection of a past style and a present content, their inadequation. Sometimes it's apparently for laughs, as when Consul mismatches a 19th century circumlocution and euphemism to a 1980s childhood image repertoire, speaking of, quote, bedclothes done in the boy and beagle style of Schultz. And the, the deliberate presentation of content as style there is typical. Um, at other times, a fantasy of a past prose hits the American present, quote, Possessed of a style and bearing consistent with the rank of officer, end quote, its stateliness intact and entirely inappropriate. And these chains of stunned syntax from an imagination of another century of writing are prefigured by the poem's titles, a shifting series of ones and zeros that translated number the poems in perfect order, but untranslated are the raw binary code that writes us in so many ways so that these streaming on-off instructions might also refer to the poet's sense of the codedness and anachrony of autobiography in general. Consul's second manuscript, which I think is just about to be finished, is called um, The Odyssey. It's spelled T-H-E and then a gap and then O-D-I-C-Y. So The Odyssey, which means a justification of God, but with a kind of brokenness in the middle of it. Um, Theodicy maintains the serial logic of Brief Underwater, but trades in its binary code and fastidious prose for sestets of overloud, inconsistent pentameter. And the measure flares too often to be only ironic flight from the modern. It asserts itself as one form of what all poetry is after, an estrangement from instrumental speech, 
But here we're witness to a further refinement of that permanent desire in that the Odyssey wants to estrange itself from the default instrumentalities of contemporary verse as well, a norm of lineation that won't court rhythm obtrusively. And yet it uses a default prosody to do so, leaving one norm by way of another or leaving neither. Consul argues in the broken etymology of his title, The Odyssey, A Justification of God, and the pun that that brokenness affords, The Odyssey, he argues for something like a justifiably erratic running back towards versus home without a chance of arriving there. Quote, to serve a universe so meagerly illumined, I proposed a global form encircled by straight lines whose center held all places at all times, whose silence grew apparent as if to impugn my grasp of a complicated situation. As serve rearranges its letters to become the verse and universe, and the perfect schoolboy pentameter of those first two verse lines decays into extra stresses or extra offbeats by lines three and four, we become aware of an effort to serve complicated situation rather than reduce it to wieldy diagnosis and formal certainty the Odyssey plays differently as a second book than it would as a first volume because its metrical imperatives must be read against the meter-denying, lineless prose poetry of Brief Underwater. All second books have to be read against the term the first book is, but Consul has carefully permitted himself this unembarrassed but self-conscious return to earlier archival sounds precisely by preceding them with prose. The return is not merely through literary time, but across his own extant work. Much as the Odyssey moves within itself from nearly obsolete rhythmic regularities into metrical limit cases, both reproaching and reapproaching contemporary writing. Consul's first two collections move in the opposite temporal direction across the same coordinates, from a contemporary ametricality into the rhythmic satisfactions of a pentameter willing to make a word like Monsanto scan or to speak of the, quote, stress positions of tortured bodies. Consul seems bent on using every strategy in the Western repertoire, quote, this old thing, this vehicle capable of kneeling. In relation to just about any of its products and persons, it's an argument that spans his books but doesn't disdain their boundaries, proceeding instead by way of them, so that the marketplace facts we call collections become the discernible formal units in a silent poetic series, one which deserves to be called a corpus instead of just a career. It's therefore my great pleasure to introduce a leading member of the Topeka School, Cyrus Consul. Well, thank you very much, um, Charlie and Jeffrey, for inviting me. And uh, Rebecca Edwards, very happy to be sharing the podium with you tonight. And Jeffrey, thank you for a superb introduction. Um, I'll read first. <clears throat> I'll read first from Brief Underwater. When I first saw the need for a study of this kind, I was living with my brother just out of sight from the house in the past. I suppose we were waiting for Black Monday. There were comets in the air. It was beautiful over Libya and beautiful over Chernobyl. In fact, it was so beautiful that you had to turn away violently, sometimes only seconds after liftoff. Our teachers were too stunned by the direction things had taken to be of any use. But none of this meant very much to me or to Mickey. We were taking our meals on a rope, going through butcher paper like there was no tomorrow. We drew planes in profile and bullets in mid-flight. We were still convinced of a graphical solution. In fact, there was no tomorrow. That joy would know no equal, which, if it was not unalloyed, shone with a brighter luster. The gutter was full of fascinating detritus. Then the gutter was full of leaves. Then the gutter was full of boats. And then the snow melted. And then the snow fell. 
the stripe consisted in no more than an effect it produced, and accepting the stripe on my shirt, the composition lacked gaiety. Over the bridge, the sky was clouded and inarticulate. Yet, once more looking into the ice trapped under the river, I saw Gamble Gold on his colorless horse, the hills closing around them in the salt air. I set about work independently there in that place and shortly revisited some of the thinking I had done with my brother. For good or ill, I have always behaved in accordance with the belief that knowledge comes as well from idle contemplation as from study in the end. And to that end, I cultivated a desire to understand romance, which seemed most apt among the models I had at my disposal to miniaturize, predict, and to some extent explain my experience since 1977. For years, I did not seem to get anywhere. To speak of moving in place, or as I was then fond of speaking, monsters of the deep. This was a phrase I had picked up and which I carried with me for many years, ignorant of its meaning. I used it to get by. You could say that I had a problem. For a number of months, a number as it were between one and 10, I returned to this place where I busied myself see above, and knew my means dwindled, though I took care not to discover when or how they would away. I put down the little volume to look for a few moments at the corner where my shoes lay, to glance at a length of cord I must have picked up in the street. Rising from my chair, I took six steps, for example, in the direction of the medicine cabinet. Again, the length of cord, the insolent length of cord, Cherry, I reflected, taking a gorgeous draft. I put my forehead to the space bar to see if I would cry. At no point have the events of that period been clear to me, not even, I think, during their occurrence. It is with agonizing slowness the pertinent memories have crossed, singly and under cover of darkness, in the manner of defectors, into my conscience the only place where I have been able to examine them. Having lived, I have read, is the surest form of existence. To reflect upon having lived can dull pain, banish fear, and mitigate doubt. Yet I reflect upon having lived and only marvel at my inertia, how I came to love shirking, sleep, and drunkenness, how I reveled less in exercising my faculties than in admiring their distant and graceful repose. With a single pistol shot to the head, South Vietnam Police Chief Brigadier General Nguyen Nok Loan, and then you came in wearing your hat that said Pop's Boy with my picture there and that of the catfish. I heard my brother throw back the bedclothes and repair to the kitchen moving a chair to gain the counter, whereupon he opened the cupboard door, opposing its progress with one hand while he pulled with the other so that it made almost no noise. Many years later, these bedclothes would retain the power to cheer me, both by the inimitable distress of their fabric and by the illustrations they bore, done in the boy and beagle style of Schultz, faded to the tonal consistency of a wash, exhorting those who would become the teens of the 80s to see America first, nor backpack through Europe like the glum trio depicted slinking over the Bosporus, guitar slung and buried in hair, rank with hashish and innocent of water. We beat the donkey with sticks and we beat it with rope. To a joist we tied it, its swollen belly we beat until it crumpled, until its head hung and swayed as if it read something in the balsam sprays strewing the floor, though its eyes were useless. Give it to him, we were shouting. My new friend stumbled around in his black blindfold, begging cigarettes. He knocked the ficus into a table whose legs folded at once 
each coming as if by design into alignment with an edge so that the piece executed a quarter turn and collapsed, seeming to curtsy, its white cloth billowing out to take the punch, which broke its bowl on impact with the floor. Like an animal fleeing over crusted snow, the red runnels rode atop the linen for a moment before sinking through. A cry went up. My friend fumbled about with the donkey's tail in his hand. For God's sake, he shouted, someone help me. But our position was far too valuable to give away. Like many men, I have inflicted my only serious injuries. We remained back of the house. My friend's Jamaican pearl was singularly excellent. When I looked through the bay window and into the kitchen in the warm light that relieved the dusk stealing into our quarter, I saw men and women mouth words of little meaning. When I looked out over the poverty grass waving below the dark band of the sea, I felt time slip unaccountably forward, or it seemed backward. A tremendous ocean liner stood in the bay. The poverty grass was like green static. It was going to have been a beautiful day. I have in my possession a packet, you may as well know, of double happiness cigarettes from the 7-Eleven where the clerk turned me a conspiratorial eye. My brother died of mouth cancer, he said today. And the regulars played at Kino, that frailest of the gambler's forms, and no one got it out, though they stayed late, paying the clerk no mind, who paid them no mind in return, steadying his little flask where he thought I could not see it, which so willingly gave in return for the woe of privation, the woe of abundance. Though the store abounded in responsibilities, for a time he had nothing, and the match heads hissed into particles numberless for multitude, the floor demolished the jar, the light was spent, the pocket dictionary sat on the toilet, defining its words with its words. Being there, you might imagine, brought me to an order of bliss for which I commanded no vocabulary. A variety of experience opened for the first time that night before the bathroom mirror like a vein, but it did not. Being in love was pleasant, dilute, unfamiliar, the irresolution and lack of practical energy which so deeply marred my later life had already begun their injurious work with me. True love changes everything and almost nothing. Maybe I didn't mean that. Because I had no notion how far we might be going, I allowed myself as a way of passing the time to recapitulate the many and diverse such trips to work sites I had weathered in my brief adulthood, which I found to be without value. My employment was a pleasant memory. Hours remained before the fellow beside me would be overtaken by his lack of proper training at the business end of a powder actuated fastener. When I had blown out a cloud of smoke, he shook his head. Ahora que estás pelón, he said, ya no te quiero. I felt as good then as I ever did on the island. I was in the shape of a lifetime. This, after all, is America, where everyone has been in love two times. A little sadly, we fondle our keepsakes. Here are the little stones the wind and sea carved out of stones, out of bricks and glass, red pebble, clear pebble, bitten and ground, formal upright style, cascade style, wind-blown style, formal slanted, clinging to rock style. Each shape bespeaks a long acquaintance with the isometric. Each endows its occupant with impassive beauty. In music, I have always seen figures, the single packing their things in pale sunlight, the twice-loved girls coming home from work. Can we stop for a minute? Wait, wait. Rampant speculation having destabilized my mood, I bethought myself to that island, which never failed to awaken me to the possibilities of romance, a phenomenon about which my considerable fund of ideas I had arrived at exclusively through lengthy and involved Gedanken experimenten. 
simple presence in that part of the city whose constituents never entirely left one's sight portended to me chance encounters, supple and poignant in their details, precipitated by instances of mechanical failure and sudden rain. It is a blimp on the skyline, a blimp passing overhead, the only sound the treetops grazing its underside, an airship 350 feet long and mostly helium, a fluid that would under no typical circumstance lend itself to the formation of compounds. Moved by wind alone, it feels no wind. And at the end of its travels, though its girth defies embrace, needs nothing so much as to be held. Tiny people of the city look skyward. The blimp is pale. It loves line and not color. Line like the sports of its childhood, whose objects were mere distances. Just above the east side, the mishap befallen triangle of which one cannot cease to conceive as one's own, the blimp addresses him with an essay like a low wall, solely to beautify that space that extends between them, which he would not think to cross and could not cross indeed. Just above the island, an entreaty in the tradition of modern Hungarian music that never repeats a thought only rises like the brilliant weapons of the forces of good, which would sooner turn to ash than fall back into their assembled crowds. Yes, its career had been less brilliant if for other battles, and later in life, if that is possible, it would be rewarded for its suffering by being given to understand why it had been. That was more than enough for a lonely blimp bobbing and weaving in the sky, who never loved or made love, but who cherished a loving fondness for trees. To him, they were as miniatures, statements of extreme compression and brilliance, moving not but by dint of supreme effort. When I first saw the need for a study of this kind, we were the last family on our block without color. The city was full of good music back then. The stars were like tiny points of light in a great void that moved from us in all directions without ever getting farther away. I had two years to live. The manifold phenomena of light by which the steadily and uniformly illuminated area may be distinguished from others of identical size and shape. For example, blue, light green, dark pink. For brilliant, read light strong, the brilliant feather. For deep, read dark, strong, the deep whiskey. For pale, read light, grayish, the pale cremains. For example, Eddie Carmel, brilliant, pale, and deep, whom I can no longer resolve against the drapes, against the lamp I have stared so long. Before those four minutes in which we were called upon to reconsider the definition of silence, I had always believed myself to float in silence. Now I knew it for a fact, a fact that had lost all its power to impress. I longed to detect the old silence. Again, maybe the blimp suffered. Silence, like the sports he could no longer enjoy, required two points, and here he had no one. The star was a perfect namesake for him, who had spent his youth nosing around in them, or so he thought, and now could not avoid bringing it up, making a mess of things. Pure, uncut stars, said the blimp. The stars rolled down his cheeks and fell thickly on the paper, making it difficult. And this also, he said suddenly, has been one of the dark places on the earth. So I'll switch now to the new manuscript, um, the, the Odyssey. And, and I'll read from the first section, which is called uh, The Apathy. I returned and saw that the garden had not moved from me, but that some illness of the garden carried it away from me regardless. I saw its mountain run to dissolution, whose bright garment flown from it in shame, whose hillsides lay uncovered, sodden. Drawn and beaten irons, pestering and humbling the soil, did recreate their brutal education. 
All Nevada wept ill-colored water. From the Earth's midsection, giant engines, dull, compacted slugs of gold removed. Offering no resistance, random night come at this odd hour out of nowhere. One by one, the lesser cattle took their knees amid contaminated forage, depressed their breathing, and put out their eyes. I have this against you, Westerners. Because what other doctor had enough skill to diagnose the animal solely on the basis of its cries, could waltz into the past with a serenity reserved for things familiar, you might say psychiatry chose me. Nights continued to require of me. Huddled closely, I conserved that resource, long wave energy. At night, the earth emitted it like darkness visible upon the skin. The school emitted it, long nights I repented at its wall. Delimiting this meagerly illumined cosmos, I proposed a global form encircled by straight lines whose center held all places at all times, whose silence grew apparent as if to impugn my grasp of a complicated situation. To this we are reduced and less. We stake proverbs at dice. At least the greater biome joining Denver to Columbus is disturbed consistently. It's good to see them back silently out of your conscience, some animals. Parasites stare dumbly at some urinals. Among three rooms, two elephants. Sugar is a children's vice. At what point then precisely did it dawn on you the band had segued into immigrant song, where the wardens carry black batons and one must pick the game out with one's eyes? The thief alone knows how the stolen ember burns. The hand is sweeter than the food. At what point did it dawn on you the person you had embraced was her interpreter? Tell me if we weren't made to walk the earth, picking out our eyes we were not made. Elvis was in a better place. The style of the dog was naturally beautiful, the habit of travelers in service of God, the cowgirls under the stars, the students caught as catch could, rushed, anonymous, ever wakeful, bright, obedient, lightweight, manually retractable. They spent weeks in this attitude. For a time, they were like floating, drunk persons staggered, awkward, through a gloaming, no home to them despite the many ways they sought shelter there as if it were. Perhaps I will go. I am tired of what sets us apart from animals when everyone can clearly see a music of her own invention in the shelter of Petrushki Station, slowly sipping aftershave all afternoon. Sweatered and neurotic Fantocini bicker constantly acromegalic, solitary, and delusional, yet enough possessed of his senses to confabulate a meeker partner of proportions like unto his own, a Thracian god for Thracian purposes who kept 10 million children calm from his studio's bad privacy, retiring off stage to groom himself compulsively, to ogle poultry, trade the grouch small favors for small rock, the grouch besought that rock to cover him, to conceal from him his vengeful god, while hourly, underground, where it was warm, your women found fresh trauma to relive. Your men teased medicine into their arms. I have this against you, Easterners. I'll read from another section of the book, uh, which is called The Ophany, and it's... Uh, it observes one formal rule that's kind of important, which is the poems are acrostics. So the initials of each line spell out the word rainbow over and over again. Rotor wash, or the downward flowing air by which our helicopters form imprints in the jungle grass beneath, now stands effectively for Vietnam, because our understanding of that war omitted many things, but not the wind, we bowed our heads and fled. In this case, we refers effectively to other people, a habit we must struggle to forgive. 
In 1977, Carter pardoned nearly all the draft dodgers. I was born in 77. That's why seven of all numbers is the lucky one. Why else would Vietnam have seven letters? Ranch Hand was the name of operations also known as Trail Dust and Hades, in which diesel fuel and kerosene nebulized with certain other compounds being then developed to induce on contact with every broad-leaved plant widespread uncontrolled and lethal growth rained softly over seven million acres of jungle and plantation in efforts to deny the Viet Cong nourishment or places of concealment. By seven corporations was production of these compounds overseen. The bulk was carried out by people at Monsanto. Roundup, the number one selling agrochemical of all time, is brought to you by people at Monsanto. NutraSweets, another of Monsanto's bright ideas, like putting caffeine or vanillin in the soft drink Coke. We drink Coca-Cola long time. Remarketing is what the language suffered agonies and died for, that we might inspirit dying products with the word, no barrier between food and drug, blood and brain, flavor, color, line of sight, fire, product might withstand. What Godard said, it isn't blood, it's red. Riddle me your bad orthography and be morthologized, diet right. I paid good money to have words with you. Never mind this lady with a past bladder cancer in some rat's business or anything like that. Honestly, while Monsanto's sweeteners exceed real sugar's sweetness 160-fold and have no bitter aftertaste, I care more for yours. You were the first no-calorie soft drink, and you meant it by God, by cyclamate and saccharin, overwhelming nutriment in vitro, white grape pure zero, golden peach pure zero. Regarding the American sweet tooth, as Americans colloquially term it, I refer you to the case of diet soda. Nothing else says Eucharist quite like black seltzer roiling in a glass of ice cubes brighter than the first water. Only in Atlanta might random single syllable names be annihilated by the quarter million in search of tab. Coke's onomasts did good. Now our tongue is blanching in a Ziploc baggie sealed within a Ziploc baggie of melted ice. Hold our tongue until we get to the hospital, okay? Rambo was the wrong man to have made angry, Sheriff. God made Rambo angry in his image, lawyer of the wood, named for the sound of force. When John J. Rambo bites into an apple, you can hear operational detachment alpha wading through the artificial flood. Rambo invented colors for the vowels also. Rambo bled American Indian blood. Some say Rambo bled O negative. Rambo, universal donor, bedwetter, horse beater, fire starter, champion of common man, painter's painter, Grass, widower, hero, friend of a friend. Uh, I'll read from the last section of the book, um, which is called the, the Olipsy. Brawn to lose. This motto bore a man in livid ink across his fists. His name, it was Anthony, drinking from footprints, townsfolk forbidden to render him aid, worthless spirits given him in worship, having little given choice besides some very choice incense in the chest, in the garage where sometimes he gave names discreet to things continuous like civil twilight, which habit he could put aside when and if he chose. They were the things rather, that could not but go on calling Anthony. We begged them not to stop calling Anthony, who might think colors many times more beautiful because though we ourselves had pictured larger numbers, nothing in our minds resembled more, more, 
more, more. What made this passage regrettable is that it was recorded. So hiket ubike was not music we enjoyed so much as what we might have for ourselves. With such art we remastered clandestine valleys where the wiry needle tracked his harrowed mate. Then would she strip her sleeve and show her scars and say what strikes me as amazing about modern war is how we also leave the ground to travel. Winged cabins wake like linear clouds trailing formed of violence on the very material sustains them, the material we breathe. But Anthony, I've forgotten these tales cannot divert you. And the men sing gobelet de voyage, Let's not confuse our blankets with the soft, delicious warmth given us to feel between. Next number coming up is called Ship in the Clouds. Long with neither feeling nor distinction through the motions of an education, though he went, came nonetheless a time to put this too behind him and set out interposing distances with persons he stood to injure, being so resolved, continuing neither in one place of residence nor loving faithfully. When he became a felon, wandering, he would bestow figures like to child and woman, mute cattle gifted with wheels, globes, escaping into thin air that bore them nobly upward, thus, Quickened by his breath, bent beneath his hand, the dumb menagerie beheld a landfall, turning cheek and tail like coin crossing the damp palm of a well. What unlettered dread and yawning bookends has a six-foot shelf of dirty weekends? But you can't reinstate the status quo ante, Tony said, dropping his eyes. When at Covent Garden they induced me to brew the ginger beer that was three parts oil of vitriol, to bring out the proper sharpness of the lime. Lime, we said, although in point of fact, lemon was used. When at Covent Garden, he shook his head. At Covent Garden, when in my 30th year of scanning heaven as a monosyllable, I made bold to falsify the seven flavors, how I let the black shilling drop against the crazed desert of the tongue and broke step with the real, not to perceive the terror realized in wandering thus into a sweetness that was mere trope, one must have been awake a long time. Helicopters threshed the east meadow, patterning with their lame cadence the several rills, for it was just spring. New fallen iridescent water sought everywhere for some declivity. In glorious decline, the canopy made a figure for all entropy, wherein autumn spoke not of an age, but for all time, the very composition of data into sequence being record and instrument of its undoing. These, the florist, let me have them for a song. The bird shook loose fists at his soiled estate. The dog made circles of his resting place. He was my friend, the architect of war. Whosoever would require his monument need only look around him. Be still, those letters, I know them from a song. He saw crowded shades then, laundering perforated sheets, a pallid clothing whose cheerless aspect light assisted nothing, else whose bright colors marbled long ago the wide ewer surface, moving road that took us whither we would like to go. He awoke in woods among whose prospects numbered neither travel nor, numbered neither travel nor advancement, the ash went mantled in her namesake, scoring with nail and potsherd all the lovers' names into her low extremity. Shade trees puzzled over tasteless, darksome fruit. Wave 
turn desolated white. Those are your friends arrived a dollar late, standing on the bank as if to spite a transient whose only source of light long embers were, breaking of their weight into shadows on the turbid spate. He was trapped in a cycle of employment deep in the earth, fearful silhouette whose darkness as the jumbled hours moved unseen among his cohort fell or seemed to fall singly over the lanterns. The first man in earshot, he meant everything, tumblers of colorful water, private sectors streaking flash lit, masterless through dorms, known things disintegrating in their hands, known things faking seizures in the padded darkness of their mouths. The sirens wound back into the base metal coils that had occasioned them. The bells choked down their tongues and were still. Then someone said, we will return no more. They felt themselves swiftly taken up into ulterior consciousness, hollow without volume. Typographers would call this space air. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. So Cyrus has agreed to answer some questions, if anybody has them to ask. And I will start randomly calling on people and shaming rituals. <laughs> yes. Uh, just to clarify, so all, all the poems from the first book were in prose that you read? That's right. All the, all the poems from, from the first book are in prose. There's 50, and they're all about this long. Yeah. And all the poems from the second book are in 18 line format, three stanzas of six lines each, except for those acrostics, which are s like sonnets. Why says so stats? Uh, boy, that's a good question. Um, Why sestets? I very early on in the sequence, I had some idea about trying to trying to use the Book of Revelations t to generate material for the poem, and I thought if I could e use the number six 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 in there somehow, it would be really cool. But that conceit sort of fell away pretty quickly. It, but it left this artifact of the stanza structure that has been impossible to to get rid of. Yeah, I, I guess then about the new book, could you talk about, uh, do things like Monsanto or Vietnam find their way in there because that's where your idea started? Or does that new book more build up a formal principle or something like that? So you're asking, when I use terms like Monsanto or Vietnam, if those, if, or um, what were your example terms? Well, Question, I guess it actually applies to the other book too. It, it had to do with when you're writing, if the shape of your idea has to do with something you're trying to write about, or if it has to do with the, the shape of the poem you're trying to write. It, I see. So I would say, I guess that it's, it, that I, I want to deal with Monsanto and Vietnam, but I should be clear, it's Vietnam as absorbed by a preteen in the in front of the television during the, you know, during the 80s. Um, I wanted to try to find a way to deal with those concepts in the poem. And then they, they, the words end up being formal uh, obstacles, really, as Jeffrey pointed out in his, in his introduction. But so um, I was really interested learning about um, Agent Orange and the, the program for defoliants. And there were many herbicides um, invented through this program. Uh, to defoliate uh, parts of Vietnam, and those later on evolved into into things like Roundup or uh, forms of weed control that we use throughout the world. I mean, it's it's in every sip of water that you take, I think. And uh, the same kind of people are um, 
keeps showing up in, in working for Monsanto one day, working for the state the next day, working for Coca-Cola the next day. And I, I had hoped to use the poem, use the writing of the poem as a way of kind of getting clear on what all that meant or whether it was significant or not. I had hoped to do that. Um, but the, it ended up, then that's when it ends up starting to become material and syllables and parts of a formal structure because it's impossible um, at this point to bring it into some kind of coherent um, statement. Um, two questions, feel free to answer one or both. Um, I get the sense that sometimes prose is really generative source material for you. Um, if you want to say anything about that, I'd be really interested in hearing it. And I'm also really interested So the first part of your question is asking me to comment on how prose, how I might use the prose mode as a way to well, generate. Reading prose, if, if reading prose is, I, um, okay, let me rephrase. Prose is generative source material for you. Yeah. Um, so yes, certainly, certainly. And a, lo and a lot of this first book is just sort of biting uh, off big pieces of prose wholesale and trying to incorporate them um, into a lyric f form. It's almost like um, taking prose samples. So I've, I've found when I was writing this book that I could really get absorbed in novels, particularly in novels written during the 19th century um, in English or translated into English. Um, so, so yeah, a lot of the imagery that found its way into those poems came out of the, the novel, I mean, out of prose forms. And certainly very little came out of verse forms. But so in the current project, to transition here to the second part of your question, the current project is, tr is really deliberately trying to use a strict metrical structure of a five stress line as a constraint to, to sort of say, here's the shape of the poem that you've got to write on this page. Um, now tr try to find a way without stealing from novels to, if you can help it, to, to fill it up that, that form with words. How many, do you have a restraint for how many lines of body stress lines? Um, I, I, it's mostly stays at 18, um, but there is a brief section of 14, 14 line poems, but it's, uh, so they stay at that length. Thank you. Is that a question? Yeah. Did you answer it? Anybody else? Is there a, um, is there a, um, a poetic group that you would feel like you appreciate more or associate with more? Well, a group or poetic from uh, that's currently active or, or one that's. Boy. Well, Jeffrey mentioned the Topeka School. I learned a, I learned a great deal from um, my friend Ben Lerner, who is from Topeka. And uh, there are other great poets from Topeka, like Eric McHenry and Ed Skoog. Uh, who, so I like to, I mean, if I had to name a, a, a school or a group of some sort, it would probably be that one. Um, but I don't think I can come up with another, or with another group off the, offhand. That, it's possible, but not for me. Uh, <laughs> um, I think that's. I th I don't think I could even begin to, to answer that now. I don't see it that clearly. Um, uh, but, so in the uh, first book, it kind of actually reminded me of Paul Clare, like these different sort of sides of consciousness that really uh, sort of like the consciousness determined the, the kind of objects you were looking at. So, but I was wondering in each one, were you trying to shift different characters or consciousness or was it more determined by the objects that were in relation? That, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, I think I was trying to shift, I was trying to take the emphasis off of a single identifiable speaker and instead try to turn these utterances into um, components of a, of a poem. So I would play around even with shifting um, 
grammatical numbers in the middle of a poem. So if a sentence would start out, I did this, and, and then later on in the, in the paragraph, it would be he did this or she did this. So I wanted to try to, to destabilize those um, sites of consciousness, or, or as you put it, um, in order to bring the structure of what's being said, the, the sound and the, and the cadence of what's being said into the foreground, the, if that makes any sense. Um, definitely tr trying to keep um, stable characters or, or, or sub subjectivities from emerging in the book. So building off of that, but one of the things that I noticed in reading that book was not, was the echoes that moved from piece to piece or showed up in different places, so not just the citation within a piece, but the ways in which that would reawaken someplace else. And I wonder, I wonder, did you see this as one poem? Or were each of the poems, I think quite yeah. a chorus of voices, but I also, there was definitely not a single voice. Yeah, that's a that's another really good question. And I think I would have to say that I I did see it as as one poem and wanted to write it as a book. Um, and um, that that worked to vi and didn't work in different places, but certainly I wanted the different pages to interact with each other and echo each other. Uh, but I I hoped for it to to cohere into a single um, a single piece. All right. Then. Thank you very much for coming. And. Um